Thank you. So I'm Naomi, and I'm going to talk about uh, the mini parser generator for Rust, uh, the min, uh, Rust parsing in general, and more especially the mini LR parser generator. So a short disclaimer first. Um, I put a lot of things into the description of my conference in the CFP because I really, really wanted my talk to be accepted. But eventually, I just got assigned a half an hour slot, so I will definitely not have the time to cover everything that was in the resume. <laughs> so sorry about that. Um, so let's start at the beginning. Uh, what is Menir? Uh, okay. uh, Menir is an error parser generator which was initially designed for OCaml. That's it, it was written in OCaml to produce uh, OCaml parsers. Um, it can also produce Cork parsers. It is, it's developed at the INRIA, which is a French national research institute where I work. And it's very widely used in the OCaml world. Uh, I could have liked at the time to dig a bit more deeply on what is LR parsing, but I will not have the time for that, so let's just recap the basic. So, if uh, you know YAC, LR parsing is basically the kind of grammar that YAC handles. Well, in fact, uh, the old YAC handles only LALR, which is a more restricted class of grammar, but modern YAC likes handle the full LR class. It's the class of grammar which are, which are context free or context insensitive, so grammars which does not contain any kind of ambiguities that could be resolved with only a broader context. And uh, they are par you can parse them using uh, push down finite state automaton, which is a finite state automaton which is augmented with a stack of states for the contexts. And it has the very useful property of a runtime complexity uh, being linear on the size of the inputs. Um, well, so LR parsing is better explained with an example. So this is um, an example of a mini parser file. So if you know YAC, it, would be, it should be very familiar. It's really the same as a YAC uh, file. Uh, you have at the top uh, Rust definitions, which will be included verbatim in the output. Definitions of tokens and uh, their types. Notice that we have to include the type for every non-terminal like export, uh, not only for the tokens. This is because the uh, Rust type in France is much less powerful than OCaml's. Um, then we include the double person sign, just like that, for absolutely no reason. And then we have a list of uh, syntax rules, uh, which look roughly like uh, BNF uh, grammar definitions. So those, this kind of parser is kind of easy to write if you already have a BNF definition for your grammar. You just add semantic actions, which in our case contain Rust code. Uh, so this is a valid uh, mini Rust parser, which can be compiled down to Rust code. Uh, my work has been to port mini to Rust, which has been relatively easy because mini was already supposed to support several languages. It has, a back it, in fact, two backends for OCaml, one which um, produces uh, tables that encode the transition tables of the automaton, and another that encodes the automaton as a nest of recursive functions, and a backend for cock. Um, because, yes, by the way, Menir can produce proved parsers, which means Menir is not proved in itself, but uh, there's a technique here in which uh, a certified tool, a tool which is itself verified, is used afterwards to check that the produced automaton is indeed, uh, matches indeed the same language that the input grammar. And that's the technique which is used in the ComCert certified compiler for the C language. It uses Menir with this technique to verify the parser and it works. So Menir is a pretty solid piece of software. Um, so what I've done is essentially that I wrote a table based backend for Rust, table based because it's easier. Maybe in the future I will try to write a code based backend, but for now it's a table based backend and it's pretty fast enough. So that's how it looks. It's ugly. Um, I, I omitted uh, most of it, but you can recognize the structure of a, no, of a finite state machine table. You have the action table, which when indexed by a number of states give an, an, um, a number of a token gives the next action. And below that, um, 
a set of rules which, all, which contain the, semantic, uh, the code of the semantic actions which will be executed when a reduction is performed. Uh, notice uh, the matches which are boilerplate code generated by Meneer to extract the semantic uh, data out of the stack and push it back on the stack afterwards. Here, underlined by the comment, is the verbatim user code that has been copied from the parser definition. Um, the matches, actually, what those matches actually do is that they have to unwrap the semantic values from the stack uh, because the stack contains uh, data of several types, so they are tagged, and those type checks doesn't actually uh, have, are, are actually completely useless, so that's why the other case is unreachable. Um, most modern, uh, pass, not, not even modern, most parser generator just use unsafe code to extract the data but for now, it uses this type check, which was pretty useful during the development. Uh, fun, fun story. What triggered the original authors of Meneer's interest into LR parsers was that they discovered that uh, those type, dynamic type checks or unsafe codes could be eliminated and replaced with GADTs. So that's why they wrote Meneer in the first place. But at the time, OCaml did not support GADTs now it does, but the backend of Meneer would be too complicated to rewrite. So the reason why Meneer was written in the first place has never actually been implemented. <laughs> okay, so how do we use that code now? The packaging was really uh, the biggest problem here because we have to distribute something which is a mix of OCaml and Rust code. The generator, is, the generator is written in OCaml. The runtime library, yeah, I forgot to mention that, but on this example, you can see that uh, the code that will actually interpret the table, that will actually execute the automaton, is not in the generated output. It lives in a separate crate, which is referenced on top, which is mini runtime. And it has, been to be, it has to be distributed too. So you have to distribute a generator written in OCaml and uh, run t uh, runtime written in Rust. The first option was to use OPAM, which is the OCaml package manager, which is obviously not a good option because when you're a programmer and you're writing Rust code and you want to use Meneer, you shouldn't have to know anything about OCaml. Uh, you, you shouldn't have to know how to use OPAM or whatever. And neither if you are uh, just a Rust user and you use a library and this library itself uses Meneer, you shouldn't have to use uh, to install the OCaml package manager just because some dependency of dependency wants it. The other option is CargoBin. CargoBin is a feature of Cargo that allows to, exec to install packages that contain a single binary, but this is not sufficient because we still need to install the runtime with it. Plus, a package cannot depend on the CargoBin, so we would have exactly the same problem if you just use a crate who itself depends on the crate using Meneer, um, you would have to cargo bin install yourself because the, the cargo packages cannot register this dependency. Uh, option three was just a regular cargo package, but the main problem with that is that the generate, so a cargo package which in its build script, build.rs script, will invoke the OCaml make file to build and install the generator, but Cargo will, will run this make file with a prefix, which is a completely obscure location. So Meneer will be installed in a completely obscure location, which makes invoking the uh, generator binary very complicated. So the idea was to write a wrapper crate, which knows statically at compile time the prefix in which the generator is installed so that it can help you invoke it. Uh, let's see how that works in practice. In practice, when you want to use Meneer in your package, you start by stating that you're going to use a custom build script and that, that custom build script will use Meneer as a dependency. So that's, what, that's why the build dependency section of the cargo terminal file is for, is for registering dependencies that are needed to run the build script, not to run your package itself. And in that build script, you use the Meneer crate, which is this 
wrapper library, and you ask it to process your parser file. That is, you do not explicitly invoke the generator on the command line. Uh, you do not explicitly invoke the generator binary as you would do with most parser generator. You go through a library which does that. Uh, on the file system, it looks like this. That is, when Cargo will build the dependencies of your package and will build Menir, the generator will be installed in that location with a mangled version number, uh, version hash. Um, but the libmenir, the wrapper library, knows statically at compile time the path of this wrapper, of this uh, out there, so it can reference the name of the binary. Then it's all good. Only the, um, the generator will produce uh, a, a parser output file that will be put in your package's own out there, which you can reference using the environment variable out there, so that you can include the generated file in your code like you do with most Rust crates that uh, generate code. <coughs> and we'll see later how, uh, how to actually invoke the, the parser from the rest of the, Rust, of the Rust code. For now, there's a detail that still has to be covered regarding packaging, which is the runtime. So the runtime, there was a problem with the runtime, which that since the Menir crate now contains this wrapper library, it has to contain two Rust libraries, one for uh, the wrapper crate and one for the runtime. And Cargo was not designed to fit multiple libraries in a single package. In Cargo, the notion of package is more or less the same than the notion of crate. A single package is a single crate. Uh, so we had to cheat. And by cheating, I mean that it's the OCaml make file which is responsible to compiling and installing the runtime library in the, uh, in the out there location. Okay, now we need Cargo to be able to find that runtime library when, uh, when compiling the generated parser because this out there is absolutely not in the Rust search path by default. But then again, the wrapper library knows the path of the runtime. So we added a second function, which is called Cargo Rust C flags. And the, what this function do, if you, were, if you were to execute that build script manually, would be to print something like that on the standard output. That is, it will print the path to the runtime, but prefixing it with this uh, little text, cargo rest ceiling search, and cargo, when running the build script, will interpret this output, and it tells you something like, add this directory to the link in search path. And this way, cargo is able to uh, compile the, the generated parser and link it to the runtime. So it's a pretty interesting use case of cargo here. It's pretty hacky, but it works. Uh, we have a project that contains code from different languages. The, it, it's quite complicated from the, point of view of the, from the point of view of the maintainer of the package, but that is me. Um, it's slightly okay from the point of view of the person who directly uses Menir in its Rust project. It's a bit complicated, but once you know how it works, it's quite easy to get along with it. And um, that was my biggest concern. It's completely transparent for uh, the indirect user of Menir. That is someone who does not use Menir but uses in its Rust project a crate which itself uses Menir. For this programmer, it's completely transparent. All that he needs to do is have the OCaml binary to lie somewhere in the path. You just, you just have to install it with uh, your distribution packet manager and that's all. Then Cargo handles all, all the rest. Okay, so what now? Now we have our parser in your submodule and we need to invoke it. This is the Lexer interface that Menir expects. That is the interface that Menir expects from a Lexer. Uh, it looks weird. It does not look like an iterator. It looks like an infinite iterator. Uh, you see that the input function can either return an error, either uh, return a token accompanied with its location, but never say stop. 
This is because uh, Minir has handles what is known in error parsing as default reductions, which means that sometimes in a, in a state, in a, an error state of the automaton, there is a single action which is possible, which is to reduce. You do not have any other possible actions. And so this way you can perform this action without looking at the look ahead token. So the advantage of this is that you can perform a lot of reductions without using the Elixir, which is a performance benefit. But the side effects, the positive side effects of this is that you can now detect the end of the, if, if the final state of the automaton is such a state, that is a state which is with a default reduction, where only one action is possible, you can now detect the end of the stream without requiring any look, extra look ahead token. Uh, which is a good thing because it leaves, if your parser does not consume all the inputs to match the start production, it leaves the rest of the input untouched for another pars parsing run or to give to another parser or another part of your program or whatever. For example, for a common line parser, it's especially useful because you can run the, the whole parsing phase and leave the rest untouched for the next command. Um, but still, most uh, Lexing tool for Rust out there, including my own uh, Rustlex, use a simple iterator interface. So what if I just want to use a, a, a simple iterator here? Uh, for that, the many runtime crates provides a simple structure which is called iterator lexer. You just give it as an argument an iterator of the lexers and it will convert it to the right interface. And if the iterator was ever to return none to indicate the end of the, of the stream, the iterator lexer would return a lexing error because since many does not need an extra, an extra token to detect the end of the stream, if it reaches the end of the stream while it still needs an input, it's an error. You actually needed that input. And then it's, the end is pretty simple. There is a single function generated per each parser. You give it a lexer and either you get a successful parse or a syntax error or uh, an error that was reported by the lexer and carried along by many. I also included an example using Rustlex. Uh, this is a very simple lexer with only five to to token types, an identifier token type, any identifier which is made of, of um, alphabetical, alphanumeric characters, the lambda keyword, the opening or closing parentheses, and the dots. And then, there's slightly uh, few boilerplate code. You just have to add a uh, nighter once uh, at the end of the token because uh, in your case, the grammar, in the, in the example I've taken, the grammar would still be ambiguous uh, without a new F token at the end, so we explicitly add it. And the enumerate is to use the numbers. Uh, it's because my lexer doesn't have a proper handling of positions in the input stream, so you just use the index of the token in the stream as an indicator of the location, so that if a syntax error is detected, it will be reported. It will say, for example, at uh, the sixth token, there is an error. Okay, so that's it. That's how uh, many address works. Um, I've said in the in the presentation of the conference of that I would try to do a comparison of error passing and of many with other passing tools for Rust out there. So I will try to do that without digging too deeply and uh, staying as honest as possible. Uh, so, short lists not exhaustive of other passing tools for us that you may have heard of. There is, for example, NOM. I think it, there was a talk about it here last year. Or by, by, there was a talk by its alpha, but I don't remember about what it was. Um, NUM is a parser's combinator library for, for REST. Uh, so let's try to, to make a, um, a comparative uh, list of differences between error parsing and combinators. The biggest pros of error parsing is that you can, it's hard to make mistakes. Uh, error passing is by, by design on those only grammar that are unambiguous, un unambiguous. So it will check during the construction of the parser your grammar to check that it doesn't contain any conflicts. Whereas with combinators, 
it's easy to accidentally make an unambiguous, an ambiguous grammar and you will only notice it when you debug some weird example that does not parse the way you think it should parse. And that's the way you will notice that your grammar is ambiguous and sometimes you will have to rewrite the entire grammar in order to get rid of that ambiguity. So that's the big advantage of uh, a lot of parsing over combined letters. The other being that they're very fast, they're always linear in, uh, in the size of the input, whereas parser combinators can, with certain pathological grammars, in the presence of certain pathological inputs, trigger exponential uh, behavior at runtime. It can happen because of uh, the left recursion, the top-down left recursion in parser combinators. Um, on the other hand, the biggest disadvantage of error passing is that combinators are much, much easier to write. Like, um, error passers are pretty easy to write if you're used to writing big enough grammars of this kind of thing, but still. And uh, even more, parser combinators are quite easy to debug, whereas in error parsers, when you have a conflict, it usually requires kind of a it requires that you kind of understand how error passing works under the hood in order to be able to debug the conflict. Minio tries to make it easier by explaining the conflicts in terms of the grammar or even than in terms of the automaton, but it still requires a bit of thinking to correct them properly. And uh, last and more important, uh, it's pretty hard with error passing to properly handle runtime syntax errors. That is, the parser is correct, but you fit it with an input. For example, uh, a compiler compiles a program which is syntactically wrong. You provide it with an, an input which is malformed. The parser should report to the user um, an error which should be as precise as possible about where the error occurred and why. And error parser makes it very hard to do that properly and I will try to um, give a short uh, introduction to the solution that Menir proposes to this problem. Menir introduces a flag, uh, which is list errors. Uh, by the way, another handy feature of the cargo package for Menir is a link binary function that you can use in your build.array script and which will create a symlink to the generator binary at the root of your source tree. Um, which is, is, which is cool during the development of your parser because you can iterate quickly, try new flags, make changes to the grammar without having to edit the build scripts and uh, run the whole cargo process at each, uh, at each time. So if you use this list errors uh, flag, Minio will generate a file containing the descri uh, description of all the possible states in which an error could ever happen. It looks like that. Well, this is a single entry in that file, and uh, I definitely don't have the time to uh, explain uh, in details what this file, uh, how, how the, these, these descriptions work, but um, to me, shortly, each entry contains a description of an input that, uh, of a kind of input that could, uh, that could lead to a certain class of errors, and the user can write, the user, here I mean the user of Menir, the, uh, the programmer will write a Menir parser, can write in this file detailed error messages. Then you give that file back to Menir with another flag which is compiled errors. You can also invoke it through the wrapper library with the compile errors um, function. And it will produce another Rust code file that you include just near to your uh, parser file. And it generates Rust code so that when you get a syntax error at the end, you get that error object, and this error object will have an asSTR method which will uh, return the exact um, error message that was referenced in the error file. Uh, Shit, it's, uh, it overflows. But uh, here, we see that the parser returned unexpected token, expected an identifier, which was 
the error message that we wrote in the error file. So that's uh, the mechanism that Menir exposes to handle runtime errors, and it takes a while to, <coughs> to get used to that mechanism, but it's very powerful. <laughs> Let's continue with our uh, comparative list. Another tool that you probably have heard of is LAL or POP, which is written by uh, Nico Matakis. Uh, it's a full LR parser. Yes, it's not LAL. Uh, you can ask him what the fuck this name, but. <laughs> <laughs> it's, a, it's also just like many a full LR1 parser. And the big advantage it has over many is that it's way, way much better integrated with the REST environment. It has a nicer syntax, which l looks more closely to the, which, uh, yeah, resembles more closely the REST syntax than many syntax which is basically the same as Yak. It gives nicer messages, which integrates nicely with Cargo. Uh, it has a nice reporting of conflicts, which uh, I believe is the same of Minir, but then again, with nicer, better presented error messages. It has macros, uh, which allows to abstract away repetitive uh, fragments of a grammar, and which, as far as I understand, have more or less the same goal in expressivity as many as parameterized non-terminal, but those only mostly work in uh, the current implementation of the Rust backend. That is, they work, but they require a lot and a lot of type and notations, which make it a bit painful to use, whereas LAL or POP has type inference, uh, which we like in many. In short, LAL or POP is designed to be a passage generator for Rust, and because of that, it's more comfortable to use in a Rust setting than Minir. Uh, okay, so there are uh, a few other features that I didn't have the time to, to dig into, but that I will mention anyway. And they mostly don't work at the moment, but uh, that's where we're looking uh, at right now. Uh, Minir, uh, the Okamu version of Minir is an incremental API that is instead of exposing just a single function that you call, and either it gives you a successful result, either it gives you an error, it will expose all the steps of the parsing process, and at each step, you can inspect and even modify the internal state of a parser. And uh, this is useful because it allows you to implement uh, specific error recovery strategies uh, that are specialized to the language you're trying to parse. Uh, whereas the default error recovery mechanism for error, for error parsers is not very flexible and not very adapted to the variety of languages that you would want to parse with error, with error parsers. Uh, this incremental API is implemented in the Rust backend right now, but it's not exposed because it exposes unsafe internals of the backend, uh, and if you were to use those functions incorrectly, you, will, you could uh, trigger undefined behavior or make the parser crash. So this, uh, this should work in uh, WIM. In OCaml, again, um, they use GADT to make sure that this interface is handled correctly, but in Rust, we still have to figure out a way to make it work safely. And the libraries, many has uh, allows to write a portion of grammar definitions once and for all in a library that you can reuse in all of your parsers. It should work, but it needs porting because the standard library of Menir contains um, semantic actions that are written in OCaml and will not work with a, Menir, with a Rust parser. And there's probably a whole lot of other issues, um, notably lexical conventions, uh, if you know the Yak syntax, you know that the type annotations for uh, terminals and non-terminals are put inside Angular brackets. And the fun thing, the fun thing is that the lexer of Minir is completely stupid, and it uh, relies on the assumption that a valid OCaml type cannot contain any Angular brackets. So in order to parse the type annotation, it will just take the first closing brackets but Rust types can contain uh, Angular brackets because of the um, generic types. So if, if you have a type like that, 
Menhir will interpret box expo without the closing bracket as being the type and it will fail. So you can w work it out by using a type alias, but it's cumbersome. You have also uh, case warnings uh, because Menhir expects non-terminals to be, uh, not to be capitalized, but each of those end up with uh, a name in the produce Rust code that Rust expects to be capitalized. So either you have a many warning, either you have a Rust warning, depending on how you name your, uh, your names. The useless tagging of tags of stack cells, uh, the thing I was talking about, uh, the useless uh, dynamic type checks when retrieving and pushing values uh, back and forth via LR stack. Uh, this should be done in unsafe or with some kind of, uh, of typing. I, I don't know how exactly we could use the Rust type system to do that, but maybe it's possible. Uh, there are a lot of features like splitting it to multiple files which is not supported, and probably a lot of other bugs that I'm not even aware of. So use it, try it, and uh, find and report those bugs. Thank you for listening. <laughs>